Welcome back to The Talking Hedge. I'm Josh Kincaid, Capital Markets Analyst and host of your Cannabis Business Podcast. Today, we've got Dr. David Kunick, CEO of UCS Advisors and Investor Relations. Dr. David, thanks for being on uh, The Talking Hedge. Thanks for having me today. Really, really do appreciate it. Really yeah. do appreciate it, Josh. Good to be here today. Tell us a little bit about UCS Advisors and Investor Relations. How long you've been doing it? How'd you get involved? What's it all about? Sure. Great question. Uh, so UCS Advisors and Investor Relations will be four years old, actually, this June. And the main reason why I kind of came about was I've actually started, uh, this is my 13th company I've started in the last 18 years. I've sold seven other companies. And really, uh, in cannabis, uh, the unofficial stat uh, that was a couple of years ago from Cannabis Business uh, Magazine was how an estimated 65% of all business owners are first-time business owners in cannabis or hemp. That's, that's a large number. They don't know how to raise capital. They don't know how to pitch to investors. They don't even know how to even, even attract proper uh, accredited investors to them. So pretty much it came out of need and demand. And the second reason why we came up with UCS Advisors is... Um, well, with one of my other companies, I had 63 private investors, which is a lot. And 55 out of 63 investors kind of said, you know, your board of directors is, is kind of screwing you over. The minute you go out on your own again, let us know and we'll follow you. And here we are now, uh, almost four years later, we represent almost 400 investors domestically and almost 200 investors internationally. And we help find them deal flow and we find them right opportunities uh, to invest in in the cannabis and non-cannabis sector. And then uh, as of um, a few months ago, we actually did a beta test and we actually did our own small little raise, which we offered a 20% ROI in 12 months. And we got back in seven months. So it's, uh, it's something that's really exciting now where people are, will bet on us, kind of bet on the jockey, not the horse. Because Josh, you know, the, there's so many deals in cannabis and hemp that if you don't act quick enough, you're going to miss out on them. Right. And if you don't have an advisory group that can take advantage of first mover advantages, then you're going to be left in the dust. Um, it always amazes me that, you know, Snoop Dogg's investment of ease, a delivery service with 35 million didn't take off. That's crazy. MedMen crumbling, you know, that's crazy. So with all of the money and all of the hype, it still is going to require, you know, traditional fundamentals like, I don't know, proper management and advisory compliance, all of those things. Uh, and they're still figuring out the hard way. Before I get into your own involvement, you sold seven companies. I want to get there eventually. But first, I kind of want to talk about your investor group. So you've got this demographic made up of over a couple hundred international investors. What are they? First off, I want to know what they were looking at before we talk about post pandemic life now. <laughs> so let's say like in 2019, were they part of the typical group that was looking for data or um, you know, accurate dosing, vaping, uh, maybe lounges? What were they looking at pre pandemic? Great question. And to be very frank, ROI, ROI, management team. If you notice, I said ROI twice. Because you have some of these companies like, oh, we're gonna get you a 10 times return on investment in five years. Well, my international investors are like, okay, let's cut that in half. Let's, let's just say it's, it's gonna be five times then. And then let's really divulge into the numbers. We can really get that five. And the, and the second big thing is really management team. The one thing that was really interesting, especially um, I took one of my companies on the Frankfurt Exchange back in 2012, 2013. And what's really interesting, especially dealing with a lot of investors over in Germany, over in Switzerland, is they want to see a management team that can make a company grow and that has a track record to make the company grow and to really make it, for lack of a better term, going from that small cap to that mid-size that, that mid cap range, to really be able to take that company from maybe less than 10 employees to 10 to 30 employees. And, and that's really where they're really looking at. You know, the, the larger companies... That, the Tilray's, the Aurora's, they kind of, that's not of interest to them. They really like to see the next big thing that, that that's coming up. So they're looking for a unicorn. They want to see a billion dollar valuation from, you know, a, a really teeny valuation, <laughs> which is. They, they, they do, but, but they also know is that the one thing I give them a credit, especially, and also depending what part of the country I'm here in the U.S. is also, or is also, okay, do you want to hit a single or a double instead of, of a home run? Mm -hmm. And it's really realizing that. 
Um, I, we have a certain group of international investors. They want a 15 X and they're willing to wait four or five years. And if they lose their money, they're like, great, we lose our money. But that's, that's something that they want. Um, and what's also really interesting too, is that, um, more so it wasn't pre pandemic. It was more so the election that they're really concerned about. And that's something that I thought was really interesting because, um, not to get into politics, but back in 2016, when, when Trump won, a lot of our international investors in 2016, 17, um, even beginning of 18, were a little hesitant because they, uh, uh, they wanted to see what kind of the international uh, rules and regulations for doing business, um, what, how that was going to change. And they were a little worried about that. Mm -hmm. What are they doing now? Now, I mean, so I, I saw the inflow, the cash inflow was was crazy right around election. In fact, we've got some predictive analytics on uh, an AI based algorithm that we've got. And that kind of gave us a 30 day window in advance where we posted on social media, you know, our cannabis stocks poised for a pop. And right after that election, you saw the cash flow coming in and all of the investment when the, the House and Senate and presidency took over. And are more bullish, I guess, on, on cannabis becoming legalized than the previous administration. So with that being said, where is the investment now post pandemic? Is it primarily still looking at ROI management team and international expansion with, you know, potentially Mexico and Israel legalizing, creating FOMO in the US? So I, I, I would take that question and I'd almost take it a step back where if we're dealing with, the, uh, or at least for us, our international investor, they're not so much worried about international growth. Um, they also know that in like in Canada, uh, the market makers really control the market up there, right? Or that's their feeling. So to really see the, the great expansion up up in our, our northern uh, country up in Canada, you know, they don't really see that. They, they're really more so looking at the expansion uh, throughout the US. They also really waiting for the, also the federal uh, re-regulation of cannabis as well too. Um, really seeing here, seeing it be able to uh, cross borders. In terms of South America, the biggest issue I always get asked is taxes, taxes, taxes. And how are we gonna handle the, the, the tax issue? Uh, we actually had several deals in Jamaica fall apart uh, several um, seven and eight figure deals fall apart in Jamaica because the investors couldn't get a straight answer on, on the tax ramifications of it. So just to clarify on that, people are going to Jamaica, Bob Marley, you know, ki kind of famous in the industry a little bit. Uh, and yet um, you can't take investment from Jamaica. It's on the FinCEN report with, you know, all the other Iran and all the other countries, North Korea, so how does that work when you go there and you have a partnership? How is that, <clears throat> how does that work? Can you take the money back to the US or are now you gonna be on some federal list? Great question. And I'm a medical guy by trade because I have two doctorate degrees. So I take a very blunt approach. I don't have that exact answer because mm -hmm. Josh, when we were trying to get that exact answer, we couldn't get it. We actually had a very large investor from Texas that was doing high seven figures and looking to do something in the Caribbean. Mm. We couldn't get the straight answers. Mm. And the worst part is, is that this is where also uh, the, the people that were receiving the money who said they had these great political contacts and get straight answers, yeah. still couldn't get straight answers. Uh -huh. And the investors were smart and they're like, we'll put a clause in our deal mm. that if you're wrong, then X, Y, or Z will occur afterwards. Mm. And they said no to that. And our investors just said, you know what, then we're going to walk. There's the one thing, Josh, I got to say point blank is this is an investor's market. There are so many deals out there. You really have to need, you really need to stand out fr from the rest. You, you really need to sit here and know your numbers. Um, really have that good exit strategy. The one thing mm -hmm. that I think is really interesting is how, uh, how many companies don't have a proper exit strategy for the investors. When do you develop that? I mean, I develop it before I even start a business because you need to have A, B, and C on your ideal, what you're willing to take, and then how you're going to reach that goal. Um, you know, when I started the Seattle Super Chronic Cafe in 2015, I created a business plan without making a menu 
and then realized that when I was pitching this thing, none of it really made sense. Because if you're creating something from outside with an exit strategy, you know, with licensing before you even create a menu, your, your priorities are wrong. Uh, and you don't really kind of get the love and, and um, the soul of it into the plan. Um, so with that being said, with an exit strategy, when do you create that? When is it appropriate to even implement that from an idea standpoint? So what we teach our clients here at UCS Advisors is sometimes you need to work backwards because people say, oh, well, I, I don't really know what I want. I'm like, I'm like, it's really simple. It's your goal to get acquired one day because less than 13% of companies get acquired. And that's a whole other realm you go. Mm. Are you looking to eventually maybe go public? Great. Then you got to set up your company from the get go in a whole nother fashion. Are you looking to make this a company that you can give to your kids? You want this company around for the next 20 or 30 years. And there's a whole nother way to go as well, too. And, and sometimes you just need to really work backwards. Um, a, a great example is sometimes we tell people, you know, this is a five to seven year run. Uh, also, too, don't don't have investor syndrome um, where you sometimes, you know, it's if your company is such a great, unique idea, maybe you have some intellectual property, maybe you have some patents. Well, great. It's better to have 5% or 10% of something than 100% of nothing. And if you know how much capital it's going to take <clears throat> and how much time it's going to take to actually develop what you have, you know what? You might want to give away 75 or 80 percent or 85 percent uh, because most of the other people are going to be doing the legwork. So what we always say is come up with several exit strategies for the investor first. Mm. And one of the biggest mistakes we see, especially with our clients trying to raise capital, is they go, oh, I want this ideal investor. I want this ideal partner. You start picking their brains and then I go, so you want someone to give you their business advice, but you want full executive control and you don't want to take their advice if they want to give it to you. You know, you can't have your cake and eat it too. Mm -hmm. So one thing we always suggest is come up with three different exit strategies for the investor. Because that even though two out of three might not come to fruition, the fact you thought that far ahead to the investor shows you're really putting them uh, as a priority. A great example is, um, we, we, uh, are, we sent a board of directors for a grow operation in Michigan and a, a dispensary in Michigan. The person's uh, originally from New York and they were able to raise their first $4 million in pretty much less than 90 days. And they had three exit strategies for the investors and it was very well thought out. Here's option A, here's option B, here's option th C. Here's a percentage of each option. Ideally, this is the option that we would like to have for all our investors. But worst case scenario, we're hitting one of these three options. And that really gave the investor peace of mind, which is the most important. I'm wondering, in giving an investor peace of mind um, and the entrepreneur knowing that only 13% are being acquired, um, why go anywhere else other than Puerto Rico? So a lot of people are going to Jamaica and I'm wondering with an exit strategy, wouldn't it be more advantageous to be in Puerto Rico, the only place in the world an American can go and not be forced to pay taxes? So what, what, <laughs> what, wouldn't that be the best advantage, especially if you're in California as a CBD company, how can you compete if you're paying 20% to the government when someone in Puerto Rico isn't? So as a reminder, if you don't have representation, you can't have taxation. So Puerto Rico doesn't have representation is the only place you can move to anywhere in the world and not pay taxes. Um, I've said that if you don't have an entity in Puerto Rico, whether it's a bilingual call center, research and development, or your sales team, you're not going to be around post pandemic or, you know, at least in a few years, <clears throat> I think 85% will be uh, out of business um, because margins are tight. Uh, what is your take on advantages in the industry and uh, utilizing Puerto Rico? Wow, you know what? You're getting some good questions today, Josh. I like this. <laughs> make, make me think here. I like it. I like it. it. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I have a slightly jaded opinion about Puerto Rico. Okay. Um, as a former CEO of a public trade company, as someone who's worked with a lot of these uh, toxic, um, in the past, convertible note guys, mm -hmm. who actually had to build or, or put some of their satellite shops or offices, I should in Puerto Rico, it's not all that's cracked up to be. Mm -hmm. And they're having issues. And it's not as simplistic as most people think. And the next step I'll say is that for myself and for what we're doing, 
Puerto Rico is not even on our radar till 2022. Mm -hmm. um, and the main reason being is that from their power outages, from their destruction, from, uh, from other natural disasters, they're still rebuilding. They're still uh, rebuilding their infrastructure. We actually had a couple of clients who were doing stuff in the electrical side and also with the electrical grid in Puerto Rico and, and pretty much lost their shirt. Mm -hmm. um, so in general, I agree with the overall concept you're saying. I just don't think Puerto Rico can handle the infrastructure for enough companies moving down there to do that. And once they become a little bit more, for lack of a better term, solid, mm -hmm. then I, I think Puerto Rico, I, I agree with you, then the next two or three years, if you're not doing something down there, yeah, the margins are too tight and, and you, you're shooting yourself in the foot if you don't do something down there. But for the immediate short term, the infrastructure needs to build up a little bit more. Yeah, I think it's a nightmare actually for um, production, you know, product development or manufacturing because of the Jones Act. You can only have one port of entry and, and exit makes an absolute mm -hmm. nightmare. But for an online service provider or sales or something like that, I think it makes a lot of sense. So 2022 is right around the corner. So you're getting there eventually. <laughs> oh, exactly. And like, and for us, like we'll start reaching out to our contacts down there in the middle of the third quarter just so we can start playing ahead. And, and Josh, I think it's one other thing that, that's really important that, we, that, uh, that wasn't talked about is that I know you're talking about, we're talking about cannabis and hemp, but the one thing people are not looking at is all the ancillary services in cannabis and hemp mm -hmm. and how you have a lot of these small to mid cap size companies that are now starting to build a cannabis vertical within their business. And that's something that's really important where you have other companies that already have very large margins and now they're starting to expand into and build a cannabis vertical for their products and services. And you're going to see a lot of these companies start in 2021 and 2022 to really start talking about those cannabis verticals. So I think that's one thing where as an investor, you need, you need to be mindful of that. With anybody looking at a North American market and investing I find it interesting that the Canadian LPs have pulled out of, uh, you know, places like Columbia, they've um, sold off their quarter million acre greenhouses or whatever. Um, so with, with the reduction in outdoor greenhouse growing in Canada and utilizing their great terroir and low cheap labor in Columbia, um, I'm curious, post pandemic, Investing in in uh, the marketplace is it going to be about automation to try and bring the cost down? Because if you're growing for six dollars a gram up in Canada and your counterparts in the U.S. can do it for a buck thirty, I would think vertical integrated agriculture, automation, AI, robots, all of that is going to have to be implemented. When is that going to happen? What are investors looking at post pandemic? So, um, a, a few, few parts. So let's talk about the post pandemic comment. Uh, what we're really seeing in our investors post pandemic, we're, we've been past the pandemic since September. It's been almost six months now. Mm -hmm. Now, not everyone might agree with that, but when you really look at where things are going, we look at canvas being deemed essential. We look at what happened at the election when you, you see, and you, you know, a lot of these novice traders are, are selling because they're, they're worried left and right. You know, the sophisticated uh, trader and buyer or investor knows what they're doing. And they were able to go gobble up a lot of great stock and, and a lot of great uh, companies uh, for pennies on the dollar. Mm -hmm. And they're doing great now. So to the sophisticated investor the po for cannabis, the post pandemic has been over for a while now. In terms of the automation and really decreasing the general overhead, I think we're gonna see by this time next year, the, the larger MSOs uh, seeing a significant uh, decrease in their overhead. Um, I think they're going to start to realize that they'll be talking about this aspect more to their shareholders. The one thing that I think is really interesting is um, uh, the larger the company, really, they're not really discussing uh, through their, their press releases, really communicating to the shareholder properly. You still really have to really dig through their financials. You still have to really get on the phone and actually call their uh, investor relations department to really start asking the key imperative questions because I'm really telling the public overall. And then I, I will say what's also interesting is, and I can't believe I'm even saying this, is that 
I have to admit in the last month, seeing some of these CEOs be on Clubhouse, the, the app, and to see them just be so free in what they're saying, I'm like, as a former CEO of a pub co, I'm like, my lawyer would be, would be calling me nonstop saying, shut your mouth. Right. But some of these things they're saying on Clubhouse, I'm like, really? Like, you, you, you're, you're going to talk about this right now with a bunch of random strangers? Like, like you, you don't have your lawyer proofreading what you're saying or what you're doing? Like, like talk about, like, just giving information out to the public. <laughs> You're, you're assuming, I mean, they are publicly traded, so yeah. hopefully they have a lawyer, but you're assuming they have a compliance department. I've seen so many that don't have like a CFO. It blows my mind. Like who's making the decisions? Um, it's crazy. Um, so speaking of compliance, you, were, you weren't you were on the DAX. Uh, you were on Frankfurt out in Germany, uh, yeah, publicly yeah. traded. That mm -hmm. takes a lot of compliance. So I'm, I'm curious how that all works out. When I worked for a brokerage firm, um, I was like the 10th employee in, in operations. We built that out to like 50. So to kind of see the compliance team go from one woman <laughs> to a team of like 15 people uh, getting gobbled up by uh, E-Trade eventually, um, I was able to see, you know, obviously the importance of compliance. We've seen that with uh, Robinhood <laughs> and that whole GameStop issue. What's it like going public? You've sold nine companies. Tell me a little bit about that and what it's like to go public and the requirements uh, surrounding that. I, so I, I appreciate that. And, and not nine companies yet. So close, seven. Seven. So I was cl close. So hopefully be selling a couple more in the next couple of years. <laughs> so, to, uh, so going public, I actually did my own S1 back in 2009 um, here in the US. And that was definitely an interesting experience. At that point, I was... Uh, young, naive, 30 year old, 29 year old, like, Hey, when, when some of my investors like, Hey, you want to take a company public and you know, you really got something here. And, you know, I think you can raise $14 million in cannabis back in 2009. It was not easy to raise $14 million in cannabis. No. I'll tell you that. Uh, and everything I could probably could have done wrong. I did wrong to the point where uh, we joked about the lawyers and compliance for the first uh, nine months, every week, my lawyer would ha we would have a weekly call for 90 minutes on what I could legally say and what I couldn't say because it, I was messing up an interview so badly, but it was a great learning lesson. I, 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 and I wouldn't change it for the world. Um, and also now to, to be able to say, being a former CEO of a pub co, especially in cannabis, um, it, it really does open up a lot of doors and it's been a great life lesson. Um, in terms of Frankfurt, Frankfurt, Full disclosure, I was extremely, extremely lucky where we had a few investors that, um, international investors that had uh, already taken other companies on the freight freight exchange. So they had the compliance department already over there. They already had the market makers over there as well too. So it was pretty much, could we afford to do, what, what, to do that? And also, do we have enough interest from uh, the market over there to actually warrant doing it? And we did. Um, overall, probably did about nine trips to Frankfurt. Um, I did about two trips before we went public over there. Um, then I did seven trips afterwards. And it was a great experience overall. But to be very frank, I was extremely, extremely blessed. People ask, what was the secret sauce in doing it? And I go, honestly, networking and contacts. And it sounds extremely cheesy to say that. But the one thing, especially what I find interesting is, especially sometimes with investors, is they don't have a large network. And depending who you network with and who's in your wheelhouse, that's how we got the Frankfurt exchange. I mean, plain and simple. I, I had no desire, had, wasn't even on my radar. So some of our investors said, hey, we mm -hmm. think you should do this. And when we started to do our due diligence and our lawyer here in the US, very luckily is fluent in German. Whoa. Yeah, like- will, will you explain that due diligent aspect of like why you chose Frankfurt? Because a lot of people will just do a reverse takeover up in Canada or the OTC markets down here in the US. Why why Frankfurt over, you know, the FTSE in London or, um, uh, you know, uh, the CAC in, in France? You chose Frankfurt in Germany. Huge market, largest one in Germany. Was that part of it? Uh, largest largest was economy it. In, in Europe, I mean. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> so a few reasons. One is um, when we did our own S1, when I started doing my own due diligence, I'm like, why don't we just do a reverse merger? And they're like, no. 
remember when you do your own S1, it's like building your own house. Mm -hmm. So if everything goes to crap, at least you could sell your original house, mm -hmm. which made me think, okay, uh, if you use uh, the, like PACE, which is primary, alternative, compensatory, and uh, E stands for emergency plan. Okay, if everything goes to crap. All right, I could always just sell the shell then because it's my own S1 and I built the house from scratch. And it's the best analogy I've ever been told on that. So now that we have our own S1 and we're doing cannabis back in 2010, kind of speculative back in 2010. And Canada, well, the, the market makers control it too much. Um, having uh, uh, some good uh, mentors uh, of mine who done who have done companies in Canada, they they told me about a lot of their nightmares. We did a few uh, we did a few preliminary phone calls of clients in Germany, and the one thing in Germany we talked about this before we started is what we really found out is a lot of the investors over there will invest very heavily in speculative deals. Mm. I mean, you mentioned gold or silver or diamonds or like some other mineral and they'll throw hundreds of thousands of dollars at it. And when I saw some of these pitch decks that they're throwing hundreds of thousands, millions of dollars at deals, I go, there's a good chance this is not going to work out. They're like, yeah, it's okay. But if it does, they're very happy campers. And, um, and after that talking to my board of directors, um, also having a, an American lawyer who's fluent in German and also had contacts in Germany as well too. It was one of those things where all the, the, the plants are aligning. Why not go with it? And, and, to, and to be very, very frank, um, talk about uh, be, being a blessing. You know, now we work with almost 200 investors, individual investors over in Europe. And that would never have happened if I was never on the Frankfurt Exchange. Um, it really opened up the door in, in a lot of different ways. I was trying to find this graph that has this um, speculation chart on it, you know, and it kind of shows over the years that people were just looking for 15% returns, trying to track the S and P and then they were going after IPOs and now they're going after, you know, Bitcoin and then like ever higher speculation and risk. So that risk reward happens. Why do you think these investors, I'm assuming they're accredited investors. So they're not the same like wall street, you know, like Reddit crowd, the wall street bets where, you know, he's, a lot of these guys want 100% return because they, the purchasing power has been diminished from overprinting of the dollar and they're just trying to claw at some kind of return. Why are accredited investors reaching after cr such crazy speculation? I mean, I know you have to infer and just kind of guess, but do you have any, any guess on that? Are we talking present day? Or are we talking like five or 10 years ago? I guess either. I mean, I, I you know, it just in, intrigues me either way. What's what's your opinion either way of why people would be that speculative? So, so let me answer that too in both in both in both scenarios, Josh. If it was ten years ago, two thousand eleven, I get it. Canvas was speculative. Hemp was speculative mm -hmm. to a degree. You know, the, what was really interesting is that when I dealt with my investors in in Zurich, Switzerland, in England, in Germany, they all knew Israel was already studying the plants. And everyone over in Europe had a friend who had a friend in Israel mm -hmm. and they knew where it was going and they, and they saw the opportunity. So, so that would make sense to me. But now, now I don't, I don't really have that answer. Um, I, I still think people forget it's 2021. <laughs> and, and, and what's interesting is when people talk about scenarios in color and just to pick on the United States, when people talk about Colorado, or California. I'm like, it's 2021, it's no longer 2010, it's not 2015. There's so much data out there that some of the stuff you're saying just doesn't make logical sense whatsoever. But people still wanna, still wanna find that, that 10 bagger, 15 bagger. Mm -hmm. And I, I joke around like we, we've here at UCS Advisors last year in 2020, we reviewed over 450 pitch decks. Wow. Only 16 deals passed their vetting process. And wow. even those best deals, the best one was a 500% ROI in 18 months or less. And we would have some of our clients say, well, find me something that gives me an eight time, an 800% return in that. I go, well, we see it. We just don't believe in it. What? And to be very frank, we actually believe in this, in this, in this five bagger in 18 months. Yeah. But if you don't, if you don't like it, then don't take it. Like wow. the one thing we always say is if you don't feel comfortable with it, don't do it. You know, have that peace of mind. You mentioned a credit and non-credit investors. 
what's interesting is um, in, because of police, fire department, uh, former military not being allowed to invest in cannabis or hemp a lot of times. That's why actually here at UCS, we actually uh, started actually a, a pretty much a, an unsecured loan program where you can invest directly in us. It gives us the power to do what we want to do and we give you a flat ROI. So, and, and having family members who are former military, having family members who are uh, government officials and to see what they are not allowed to invest in and how they cannot take advantage of this opportunity. You know, it's really interesting because one thing what we may or may not talk about today is how if you're the average middle-class American here in the US, you, you, you kind of get screwed over by the system. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah, if you, you don't have X amount of dollars, you can't invest in the X, Y, or Z. You go to your financial planner, financial advisor, they can't talk about anything in the private sector, whether it's canvas or not canvas related. So where do you go to? And, you know, they're, they're going to people like you, Josh, going to people like me. And, you know, they're trying to find better sources out there of information. Mm-hmm. And I, I, what I think is, is horrible is, I don't know if you've done this, but we actually did a study in 2019. We interviewed 100 financial planners in uh, the New York, North New Jersey region. 90, actually, technically speaking, 93 of the 100 said we would love to uh, have our clients invest in cannabis or hemp, but we're not allowed to tell them about it. Wow. And the remaining seven said, I will never refer anyone to cannabis or hemp because I won't make any money off of it. Why not? Because people are just, you know, they're they're being selfish and greedy. Though what's interesting is we interviewed 100 financial advisors between Denver, LA, and Vegas. So like uh, the mix and match. And it came out that about 80% of them said, oh yeah, we refer out all the time. We, we want our clients to invest in cannabis or hemp. Hmm. We want them to make money because if they make that 30, 40, 50% ROI, we say, great. Now give back the half that profit to us. <laughs> right. It was a nice and conservative for you. So, so what's up with the East Coast advisors not thinking that they're allowed to, like it's not like against some sin clause or something. So are they just old school and just don't understand that they can advise that? Or what's the difference I, between East Coast and West Coast advisors? I, I think it's two things. One, uh, uh, California's had medical cannabis since 1996. Yeah. The state of Maine has had medical cannabis since 1999. But mm-hmm. now, tell me what other state on the East Coast has had medical cannabis since 2010, really, 2011. Mm-hmm. You know, it's really not too much. So you still have a very much of a pre-fixed idea on what you can and cannot recommend, but also not doing your own due diligence. Like we talked about prior to the election, our phone was ringing off the hook in October saying, hey, what do you guys recommend? What do you guys like? X, Y, and Z. And I would joke around. I, and even some of my, I tell my, some of my employees, ask them, why do they go into the financial advisor? They go, well, they don't have any, any research on it. And I'm like, that's like your financial advisor, financial planner saying, don't invest anything in the internet. The internet's a fad. It's not, it's, it's going away. <laughs> And I'm like, they need to do their due diligence. And, and one of the funniest stories that I, I had someone that, that wanted to put like 20 grand into the market. And it's, a, it's about a client, it's been a client of ours for about the last three years. And she goes, would you mind talking to my financial advisor? Cause he's anti, anti everything cannabis. And I, so I get on the phone and do a conference call. And the guy says, I will not recommend anything at all to any of my clients when it comes to cannabis or hemp. And I go, why not? He goes, it's too new of a sector. I go, great. So what do you recommend? He goes, well, I recommend tech and I recommend, you know, gold. So I go, great. I go, how'd you learn about those companies? Oh, over the years, I I did, I did my research on them. I go, so isn't it time to do your research on cannabis? Hmm. And he's like, well, what do you mean? I go, tell me what other industry for the last 15 years has gone up hundred percent every single year. And, and I'm, and I'm downplaying the numbers here. Mm-hmm. And he's like, uh, uh, um, uh, I'm like, it's not going away. I, I hate to tell you that, but he had such prefixed ideas and his upper management were like no cannabis, no CBD, nada, nada, nada. So I think a lot of it really comes down to the area that you're in, the state that you're in, how much education you, you, you have overall. That's an interesting point. So on one side, you have advisors who are uncomfortable with it. And on the retail side, you have people that are just kind of speculating and not really sure what they're doing. So it doesn't seem like either one are, are, are completely informed. And yet, the markets are still rolling. 
So with with the advent of this Wall Street bets um, blatantly showing that the market is in favor of Wall Street, not Main Street. You can see that in a number of factors being that uh, Citadel Capital is the true client. And if the product is free, you are the product. And so with the front running that Robinhood does on its clients to sell that data to Citadel Capital, um, most people don't care because they're not, they don't care that they're going to pay a penny more on that bid ask spread. It doesn't matter to them. They're getting a free product. They've gamified it. But when the market does collapse and the longest bull run in history ceases to exist and these people on margin lose their ass and they blame the system, what's going to bring it back? How do you bring credibility back to the, the public equity markets uh, when it's just been blatantly obvious, in my opinion, that it's rigged to Wall Street. Oof, man, you're asking the loaded questions today. <laughs> I love it, man. You, like, can, you can disagree with me. I, no, yeah. I just, well, so, so, cause, cause I, well, that, literally that's right. I, that's why I bring a pen and a notepad. Cause you're asking these little questions right down my thoughts. <laughs> Got it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. So well, let, let's break down what you said. First off, Robinhood, as we tell everyone, all the separate programs in general, listen, you, you don't control it, plain and simple. And what's interesting is I actually spoke at a cannabis conference in 2019 in November. And someone asked me about Robinhood and I said, don't do it. It's a sham. One day you'll be taken advantage of. And you're not going to be able to get out of your position. And ironically, when GameStop and all that happened, someone reached out to me via email saying, oh my God, Dr. David, you at Canvas Conference in November, 2019. I'm so happy I didn't do Robin Hood, you know, cause you said that. I totally forgot I even said that. Yeah, right. Frank. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so that's the first thing. The second thing is, is that I think we got to take it a step further. And this is a medical guy. I mean, so like I take a medical approach towards business and I take what, what we call a multidisciplinary approach. We got to look at every aspect. Everything needs to work together in harmony. If you were to look at, and I'm going to say under the age of 29, and I'm going to say probably 18 years old to 29 years old, instant gratification. Mm -hmm. they, want, they want instant results. They don't want to take the time to learn. And they also, and I hate to say this, almost they don't want to learn from the mistakes where it's a game rigged. Yeah. To be very frank, I tell people, if you really want to learn, learn how to be, become a technical trader, take the classes, learn how to actually read a graph. Learn actually that the sayings uh, and learn how to like to buy on the dips. Learn, like example, you mentioned, like I can say the word VWAP to you and you know exactly what I'm talking about, right? We go to have the people that are investing a couple hundred thousand dollars on Robinhood or whatever. You mentioned what VWAP means and they're like, what are you talking about? What's VWAP? Huh? Was that a new rap group or something? Like, you know, so I, it's, it's a lack of education. Mm -hmm. It's also the lack of taking the time to learn and to be very frank, if you don't want to take the time to learn, pay, you, you're, you're going to have to go maybe pay 30 or $40 a trade, you know, or $50 a trade. No, you, you may not like it, but you know what? At least you're going to get someone sophisticated that knows what they're doing for you. And then in terms of the market, um, I think it's really interesting how the market has changed over the last five to six years. And as someone who dealt with a lot of international clients who were big fans of the Obama administration because they felt they could take advantage of the administration versus when Trump came in, they felt very scared and not knowing what would happen for a couple of years. So now they feel they can almost take advantage of the situation again, that, there, that there's lack of a backbone. And these are some of the exact words from some of my international clients. Um, I'm not saying I agree with them, but it's just interesting to see other people's perspective. And this is where I think in 2021 and also going to 2022, you're going to see the small cap and the mid mid-sized cap companies have amazing years. Hmm. And uh, really, I, and you're seeing it right now, a bunch of these micro caps are doing phenomenal. And you're going to see more micro caps start over the next year to year and a half ha have amazing breakouts. And, and I cannot stress that enough. Is that a result of capitulation, um, investment capital, or like what's driving that growth? Investment capital. Um, investors who still think it's 2010 to 2015, where they can get at five to six times, five to six bagger, 
versus uh, the Auroras or the Tilrays or even uh, like look, look at a growth generation. I mean, they're doing great, but do you think you're going to get that four or 500% return in the next 18 months from them? No. I mean, I think it's at $55 a share today or something like that or $50 a share. I mean, it's, you know, you, you, your opportunity to get in was at 10 or 12 bucks a share with that. So, and the other thing is too, is that I got to give the micro cap companies they're, what they're really realizing, especially in cannabis, the more you talk in, to your audience and you, and you take advantage of social media, you, you get more press releases out, you really communicate, um, you know, it really shows a, a big difference. I mean, heck, a great example is, um, I won't say the company out of respect to them, but you had a company that just did an open Zoom call with its shareholders a couple months ago. Can you tell me the last time someone did it, it like literally like a uh, Aurora Capital or like a uh, uh, like any of those companies doing having their CEO get on a live Zoom call, mm -mm. take live questions and speak for an hour and a half? No, I mean that's that, but that also has a lot of uh, that builds a lot of shareholder confidence though. Yeah, but is it the right shareholders? Because I would think that an institutional investor would be scared um, and not want to invest because of the riskiness of just getting on live and, and saying something. Uh, you don't see that typically. So I would think that would actually scare a lot of brick and mortar investors away. So let me ask you this. You originally said institutional investors. Are you saying institutional investors are the same as brick and mortar investors? Uh, I think... Yeah, I think anyone other than retail, let's put it that way. I think it's okay. going to scare a lot of people other than retail away. Yep. No, the reason I'm asking that is that just because it's interesting because everybody's in slightly different terms. And I do agree with you on that. But the one thing, and I, I think it was, uh, was it Ben Clover of uh, Green Thumb who mm -hmm. uh, Industries, who recently in the last couple of weeks is saying, you know, it's amazing how the lack of institutional investors right now in the cannabis scene mm -hmm. and even uh, a company like green thumb, that's at like $30 a share right now. There's still them having a lack of really institutional investors where that's mm -hmm. where I also, and we talked to our clients about this, where we, we tell people point blank, in our opinion, you pretty much have till the third quarter of 2022 to get in and still make a really good ROI. Yep. Is there going to be a good ROI after the third quarter of 2022? Yeah, there is. But I think you're going to look at your 20%, 15%, which is still great. Don't get me wrong. Yeah. But to really take advantage, you know, you got about a, a little over a year left. We just did an interview with Larry Swedrow of um, Buckingham Wealth Management. Uh, and he's been in the industry a long time and knows all about SIN stocks. So yep. um, on March 7th, we'll, we'll have episode 666 of the Talking Hedge. And it's going to be about SIN stocks. Uh, again, because they kind of don't, like you were mentioning, they don't have a lot of the institutional investors behind them right now. And typically, SIN stocks are discounted at about 20% as everyone's diving into tech, you know, Facebook and Tesla mm -hmm. and all this overrated garbage that um, a lot of the central banks, Switzerland, Japan, have billions of dollars of Amazon and Apple and, Net and all this stuff. Like, I'm out because they can just print money and buy that. As soon as, you know, the shit hits the fan, guess what? That's a drop and your margin call is getting nailed. And then next thing you know, uh, Bank of America is trading at 99 cents like they did in, in, uh, in the last recession. Yep. So I'm out. Um, I'm curious, though, with the advent of... Um, the next crash, what is going to build confidence? Is it going to be artificial intelligence? Is it going to be machine learning? Is it going to be algorithmic trading? What's going to give people that confidence to get back into the market? Um, I really think it's going to be algorithm trading is, is the minute short answer. Um, and I really think too is I think, Overall, I think we're gonna actually going to see an uptick in the private sector for, for cannabis later on in the year because uh, people are going to see that the opportunities for the pub coast and cannabis and hemp just aren't as advantageous anymore. And realistically speaking, when it comes to voting the confidence, I, I, I hate to say this, but I think it's going to, between a little bit of, and I, I'm talking about for, for the layperson. You got your job back. Is your job secure? 
Is your state open to pass 50% capacity for dining, restaurants, everything in general, even the mom and pop stores? And thirdly is what platform do you feel comfortable trading in? And what I think is interesting is how many of like the Raymond James out there or even uh, for lack of even like the TD Ameritrade's like, not that saying that's a great example, but you know, you have an opportunity to take advantage of what Robinhood did. <laughs> it's like, this is why you don't use Robinhood. This is why you should be coming to us. Or uh, like, like I, I work with a company called Capital Securities and they have a few offices and they've been doing training for me for years but they're a little expensive. And people say, why? I'm like, because I don't have to deal with the Robinhood BS where I joked around with, with, one, of, with one of my brokers and I said, why aren't you guys advertising, taking advantage of this opportunity? Because you have people saying, okay, where do I give my money to? Where can I actually give my money to to sit here and build that trust on what's going on? Um, and realis realistically speaking, the people that are the higher middle class, upper middle class, they're not using the, really the Robinhoods as much anymore. Um, what I also think is really scary is we actually picked up two new clients uh, in the last month and something came up about trading. And do you know what they said on, uh, on how they do their trading advice? And I'm happy you're sitting down, Josh, when I tell you this. <laughs> no, no. So, so literally we're going through stuff and like, you know, we, we, we gave a, a stock suggestion and it's like, yeah, you know, Dr. David, we couldn't buy this stock. Da -da -da. And I'm like, in each client, I said, well, why not? And they go, well, I couldn't find on Robinhood. I'm like, wait, I go, you literally run a company that makes eight figures a year. They go, yeah. And yeah. I go, and you do your trading through what? They go, Robinhood. So then I, wait, wait, it gets even better. It gets even better, Josh. Yeah. It gets even better. Look at me. I think you see how I'm excited I am over this. About. So then it gets even better. And the guy goes, well, yeah, I, I, I follow uh, Dave Poitney, uh, oh, the, guy, my God. The, guy, the guy from from, uh, from Barstool Ooh, Sports. Sports. I go, excuse me? He goes, yeah, whatever he does, I just follow his lead. Oh, shit. I, I go to the other client. I go, what did your company do in 2020 in the middle of the pandemic? If everything goes, oh, we killed it. He's like, we have we grossed in like nine point something million. I'm like, what's your profit on that? Oh, we're about like almost 40% profit. And I go, but you do all your trading through someone you watch on Instagram wow. and on Robin hood. And they're like, yeah, they're like, why not? I don't trust all these other people in suits. Oh my God. And that, and that's, and to be very frank with you, Josh, that's where, when you ask these questions about the market and confidence, I, I'm very proud of the fact that we work with a lot of investors in all aspects of business and in life. I mean, our, our youngest client is now 19 years old. Our oldest is in their early 80s. And we're talking all aspects of for, for work and industries. But to hear people, I'm like, you literally do eight figures a year in your business. And that's how you do your investing. And I literally had to break down to say, okay, this is maybe, and like, if you're going to sit here and go throw a half a million or $700,000 into something, let me get you uh, someone with a, a little more clout than Robin. See, Josh, you're, 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 I couldn't do what you're doing right now, Josh, because oh, I turned was, my video off. I, I'd be, I, I can't, I can't handle it. Yeah, that's crazy shit. So, what about? Well, but that's what's going duty, on, though. man. Like, what? Do you, don't they have a fiduciary duty? They're literally just like throwing a dart on YouTube for investment decisions. How is that a fiduciary duty when you're managing eight figures in asset center management? That's crazy. That That's the bull market. That's the advantage of the longest bull market in history because you can't go wrong. But when it does, those people are going to get sued. And, and so so then what's interesting is that we have another client, the one that, that seven figures or so. And, you know, I, I looked at what, what they were doing and I'm like, some of these stocks, I'm like, you're up like 270, 280 percent. He's like, yeah, I'm only talking about like four or five hundred. I'm like, yeah. no, cash out your money now. No, hold cash up your life. It's going to the moon. Yeah, and I literally said, I go, listen, I go, it's like gambling, and I, I have to give people because after owning a business in Vegas, and I, I own a campus test lab in Vegas, I compare and I bring out so many clients and entertain so many clients in Vegas. I always tell people, listen, it's just like gambling. If you're gonna gamble, let's say even ten thousand dollars. And you're up, what are you gonna do? It's like, oh, I'm gonna take the $10,000, put it in my pocket. I go, exactly. Play if the house is money. At least cash out your initial investments. Or heck, you know, you can pay some taxes on that. Cash that out as well too. Like, 
you need to sit here and be prepared. But yeah, Josh, that's where when you asked a question before about what's going to like make the market stable and stuff like that, you know, th th that's where unfortunately you have people who are just like, uh, pin the tail on the donkey. Okay, I think I think that works. Okay, yeah, I'll buy that stock today. Yeah, uh, you just destroyed my brain. You really did. Um, that's something to marinate on right there. Yeah. So I, I think. Um, do you have anything else that we didn't cover? Cause, cause I I'm, I'm done. You just crushed my whole, my whole day. I got to go get high and reset. Um, that was a nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> well, so, so one, I'm happy you gave me the opportunity to, to talk today because we have a lot of investors who are what I just said the latter of, and that's scary. Uh, the biggest thing I tell people is this, is that, if you invest in gold, if you invest in tech, if you invest in real estate, it's time that you look at Canvas and Hemp in your portfolio. If you don't, you're really shortchanging yourself. I hate to say it, but Canvas has been deemed essential for the first time in over 80 years. Think about that. And if you want to talk about the pandemic or a potential depression on stuff, what always thrives during depression? Drugs and alcohol. And drugs also includes pharmaceutical pharmaceuticals. Do you know how much the the pharmacies are killing it right now? I live in New Jersey. I'm in the pharmaceutical capital of America. And now all these doctors are writing out scripts nonstop on telemedicine. I mean, prescription rate is extremely up right now. So in general, the biggest thing I tell people is this, is that campus is not going away. Hemp is not going away. You are shortchanging yourself if you are not at least getting 10% of your portfolio in that sector. So, and, and that's the biggest thing I just wanted to add to anyone here. Go out, talk to someone that knows what they're doing, get some advice. Remember, free only gets you so far. And if you've got to pay someone a few shekels to get the right advice, trust me, it's worth it because you're going to make a lot more money down the road from it. Yeah, definitely do your own due diligence. And yep, when yep. you do, you'll find out that sin stocks have an inverse relationship towards uh, market downturns. So any economic correction, recession, depression, uh, you can't have the longest bull market indefinitely. So when that time, when that event does happen, you definitely want to load up. It'll be the first time that hemp and cannabis stocks are involved uh, in a recession to take advantage of that historical uh, inverse relationship with sin stocks to kind of take advantage with the pop. They always have about a 20 to 30% discount and that discount will evaporate and turn into a premium uh, when it's the cleanest dirty shirt in the room. So uh, margin calls are gonna have to be squeezed out. Nothing is safe until that happens. After that happens, definitely load up your portfolio, but uh, that's not investment advice. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I want to thank my guest, Dr. David Kunick. He is the CEO of USC Advisors and Investor Relations. Dr. Uh, Doc, I appreciate you being on the podcast, man. Uh, uh, no problem, Josh. Appreciate it. And uh, I, I hate to say this, it, 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 UCS Advisors. Did I say UCS or say, did I say USC? Yeah, everyone says USC because yeah, people on the West Coast can think of University of California. But just so you know, and I'm going to let your audience know what UCS means. It stands for two things. All right. Yeah. If we're talking cannabis. Yeah. It stands for use cannabis safely. All right. All That's right? easy enough. I'm, we're talking non I, I'm seeing it. I'm looking at it, but obviously, <laughs> you know, English is, is hard. I miss the days when I could point and grunt and then my sister would run over and grab stuff. It was way more efficient. <laughs> um, English is not. But, but, but for non cannabis, UCS stands for use common sense. All right. UCS advisors yes. and investor <laughs> relations. Where can they find you at? Where are your links at? Um, how can they reach you? Sure. The best way is you can go to our website, UCS Advisor, which is singular.com. You always go to our LinkedIn page. Uh, you can look at me up directly, Dr. David Kunick. Um, I, we do a lot of intros through LinkedIn. And those are the two best handles for us. Okay. Yeah. UCS. Use cannabis safely, folks. With that, we're going to roll this one up. I'm Josh Kincaid. This is The Talking Hedge. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. Or don't. And I'm out. Don't forget to smash that like button on your way out and check out these other videos that we've got.